Um, and yeah, generally just thanks to, to uh, Rachel and Laura who put in a lot of the work behind Killing These Organised and Mark who came up with the idea of switching to webinars. Um, and uh, I guess very special thanks to Rob Woodhall who uh, I'm not going to steal any of his thunder by saying anything other than he is quite a remarkable human being. Rob and I have been trading emails about doing a winter talk oh, probably for at least two or three years now. So it's a real honour and a pleasure to have Rob with us here tonight. Um, and I will now hand over to Rob. So uh, good evening, everyone. My, my name is Rob. I'm a peak bagger. Um, so that involves ticking uh, lots of hills off on lists. So uh, you could be in for quite a long evening. Um, but as the uh, Wyoming road sign says there, there should be some pretty good scenery uh, en route. So, um, so to start off, um, a little bit of a delay on the slides. Um, uh, hills come in all different shapes and sizes. We can see here uh, a, a, a big one in the, uh, the Western USA uh, called Grand Teton. Um, and on the right, a quite famous Scottish um, hill, if we can call it that, it's called the Old Man of Hoy. Um, trying to get this to advance. Hey, there we go. So yeah, nearer to home. Um, we've got good old Arthur's seat, which uh, a couple of numbers there. Its height is 251 meters. Its prominence, and we'll come to that, but its rear ascent is 174 meters. So uh, that makes it a Marilyn. And uh, we've got uh, Corelian uh, near the Isle of Jura, which is a 31 meter island. Uh, we've got Stack and Armin, which is one of the uh, um, St Kilda Sea Stacks, which is another Marilyn, 196 metres high. Um, in New Zealand, we've got Taranaki, which is a 2,500 metre high peak, and it's got a prominence of 2,300 metres, which is uh, uh, not something you're going to see in the UK. Uh, Old Man of Hoy again, which is uh, uh, 137 metres high and uh, 108 metres of prominence, which makes it a hum. More of those later. And then, for example, in Ararat, we've got uh, a volcano. Sorry, in Turkey, we've got the volcano Ararat, which is a 5,000 meter summit with 3,611 meters of prominence, which means that it's one of the 50 most prominent peaks in the world. So what do we mean by prominence? Let's wait for the diagram. So if you imagine that uh, Hill C is, uh, is a Munro, and you might be bagging a, a, a Munro top B on the way down. So you get to a low point, and then you reascend a certain height to get back to B. And that's the amount of reascend, that's your prominence. So in, so in the case of a Marilyn, it's 150 meters, that drop. Uh, 100 meters, it, it's a hump. 100, hump stands for 100 meters prominence. And if you've got 1,500 metres of prominence, then that makes it an ultra-prominent peak. It's kind of hard to visualise that, because uh, quite often they're a long way apart and you need some computer technology normally to figure out uh, what their prominence is. Um, so having thought a bit about prominence, we can ask a few questions about how many peaks there might be in the world. Um, uh, Andrew Kermsey, formerly of, uh, of Google, um, retired outrageously early and uh, did a lot of um, computer analysis of uh, a huge data set that actually came out of the Space Shuttle mission. Um, and he came up with a figure of for 100 foot prominent summits, which we know as TUMPs, 30 meters prominent, there's, all, there's around about 8 million in the world, so 8 million hills. Um, uh, at uh, 100 meter prominence, we've got about 1.6 million, of which we've got uh, nearly 3,000 in the UK. Uh, more significant peaks, uh, 600 meters prominence, we've got 31,000 almost. And in the UK, we've got a little over 100. And the, uh, the best peak list of all, in my, uh, in my opinion, at least while I spend a lot of time chasing, um, all, uh, Andrew's kind of broad brush analysis came up with a figure of 1,477 of those peaks. Once you do all your map checking and uh, uh, you actually come up with uh, the current figure for ultras in the world is 1,539. So lots of peaks. 
and uh, lots of big lists. Uh, sorry, um, some of the summits uh, more interesting than others, of course. A uh, um, couple of views from Andrew's analysis of uh, 100 meter prominent sand dunes in Saudi Arabia and in Algeria, which I've got no particular intention of, uh, of going to bag. Um, but uh, lots of lists, hundreds of lists. Um, the uh, peakbagger.com is probably the most comprehensive peak bagging list that covers worldwide peaks. And as it says there, there are over 600 main peak lists and uh, over 5,000 lists that people like me have created just for their own purposes to look at kind of local things. Um, in the UK, I suppose the, the best known um, hill bagging site, it's called hillbagging.co.uk, this is probably the most accurate um, site in the world. It was a huge amount of map studying and a lot of um, uh, survey work goes into uh, these peaks. And there's things like the Munro's, Corbett, Graham's, Marilyn's Humps, Tumps. There's, uh, there's a lot of um, peaks on that, uh, uh, on that uh, site and also a lot more peaks that aren't on that site. So there's plenty of, uh, plenty of um, uh, lists around. Now a little bit about um, height versus prominence because a lot of traditional lists are just based on hills like the Munro's, they're just hills over 3,000 meters, 3,000 feet even. Um, but that re only really works uh, locally. Um, if you think about the, the highest peaks in the world, they're all in the Himalaya, um, this area here, Karakoram and then Everest over to the right, uh, Mont Blanc and uh, is of course a lot lower and if you go down to 6,000 that really only brings in the uh, uh, the Andes and you've got to drop way down to about a thousand meters before you've got more than a, a couple of hills in the UK so instead it's a lot better in terms of kind of worldwide comparison to, to, to look at prominence so how relatively high peaks are and on that basis you get a map like this with the really prominent peaks in red, uh, the less prominent peaks, but still about 2,000 meters prominent, are in yellow. And then you can pick, start to pick out the uh, mountain chains of the world quite nicely. So uh, sadly, nothing in this scale in the UK, but uh, you've got the Alps with Mont Blanc there, working east, you, you've got the, you've got the, uh, uh, the Caucasus, then you've got the main, uh, um, main Himalayan chain. Um, Upright, you've got the Kamchatka Peninsula and down through the Ring of Fire. So you've got uh, Japan and Philippines, um, Indonesia, hardly anything in the uh, um, in um, uh, Australia. Uh, sadly, it just has Kosciuszko down the right hand corner, quite a bit more in uh, uh, New Zealand, but then uh, whipping over to the uh, uh, to the New World. Uh, we've got the Aleutian Islands and then uh, uh, Alaska, British Columbia, the Western US, then Central America, and then the Andes chain, and then um, a few peaks, I guess, off the uh, off the page here. In uh, uh, so if you so once you start thinking about prominence, you've got the whole world to play with, really, and you compare you're comparing kind of peaks right the way around the world. Uh, more about that uh, uh, towards the end, but. Uh, now I want to talk about, well, a couple of uh, UK projects. Um, uh, in some ways, I guess the toughest was the Marilyn's, because uh, it's a huge list of peaks, and uh, there's no, nobody really knew whether they could be done. So again, waiting for the next slide. Um, so firstly, what are Marilyn's? Uh, why would you bother climbing Marilyn's? Uh, then my timeline. Uh, what we uh, aficionados know as the St Kilda War, and then life after the Marilyns. So looking, yeah, so what is a Marilyn? Um, it's, uh, as I said before, it is about um, the amount of reascent, not the actual height. So for instance, Ben Nevis here, that is a Marilyn because it's very high and it's also happens to be the highest point. Uh, on the island, but uh, some other quite high peaks could not be Marilyn's because they just don't have enough reascent. Equally, some quite low peaks um, 
provided they have that 150 meters drop, then uh, you've got the Marilyn, although a lot of small peaks don't, uh, don't make Marilyn status. Uh, but uh, so looking at the kind of totality um, of the Marilyns, 211 of them are Munros. Um, they're pretty localized in terms of where they are, mostly in the western west of Scotland um, and across into the Cairngorms. Once you step down to the core bits, you start getting a lot more uh, kind of coverage. You get a few more of the islands, a few more in down in England and uh, uh, and a couple in Wales. Um, when you step down to the Grahams, which are two, between 2,000 and 2,500 feet in old money, um, all of those are Marilyn's. Uh, and again, you get a much wider geographical spread. So as you start to go to the lower peaks, you get, you know, kind of much more wider range of uh, uh, kind of landscapes and geographical coverage. And you, it also gets e easier to escape the, uh, the weather. Uh, but once you get down below Graham Heights, then uh, 807 of the Marilyns, almost half of them, are actually below 2,000 feet. And they're just there everywhere. You've got uh, many in the islands, so you get to visit lots of islands and quite often have to uh, get a bunch of mates together to uh, pay for a, um, a boat out to these things. Uh, lots in England, lots in Wales. Unfortunately, where, uh, where my house is there, there don't seem to be any. Embarrassingly, I seem to have placed myself in the fastest part of the, uh, the country. But uh, there we go. You have to deal with these things. Um, yeah, so why climb Marilyn's? Well, you get to visit lots of different places. You can avoid the weather. You can keep below the cloud base, which is really good on the days when uh, the Munros are blowing a hoolie. Then uh, you can always find something that's a little bit sheltered. And uh, you get to visit the islands as well. So uh, my timeline, um, I've spent well over half my life uh, trying to do these things. Um, my first one, I think was probably Snowden. Um, I actually went up on the train as you do with my parents, although since then I've uh, been up it, uh, walked it, run it uh, dozens of times, I guess. Um, Paddy Buckley around kind of supporting that, doing that. Uh, it's accounted for quite a few. Big bagging, I suppose, stars into a five-year plan. Also the England and Wales 2000ers, which now we know is the Nuttalls. Uh, I did them before the Nuttalls were invented, really. I uh, finished those in 1990. The Donalds, the Lowland Scotland, sorry, the Southern Scotland 2000ers, 1992. Coincidentally, the Relative Hills of Britain, which was the, uh, the publication of the Marilyns, that came out in uh, 1992. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, a friend of mine uh, tipped me off about this and I thought, uh, uh, a list of 15, 57 hills, that's just ridiculous. Who could possibly be interested in those? So uh, anyway, I carried on, did the Corbett's. Um, 1995, I finished those. Then um, running out a proper hill list, I suppose. I did the Wainwrights, uh, just a few of those to finish the next year. Um, a list of hills called Dewey's came out. 500 metre summits of England and Wales with 30 metres of drop. Um, um, by this stage, I kind of got around to uh, um, figuring out how many Marilyns I'd climbed, and uh, I'd got over 700 at that point. And uh, Alan Dawson, who uh, published the, the list, he was um, starting to list uh, people into what he called the Marilyn Hall of Fame. So uh, if you've got 600 Marilyns or more, then uh, you get listed. So uh, that was me kind of started on the Marilyns, I suppose. Uh, once you're halfway, it's like with the Monroes really, once you're halfway, there's no kind of looking back really. Um, so the Grahams, the 2,000 foot um, summits between two and two and a half thousand feet in uh, Scotland, finished those in 2000. Um, the, the Submarilins, that's the kind of uh, insurance list really, um, within 10 meters of qualifying. So if, the, if, if they got reclassified, which uh, these things often do. There's an awful lot of people in the UK just uh, got nothing better to do than to uh, survey hills. So it's nice to know that uh, if something gets reclassified, you've probably done it already. Um, so 2003, I uh, by that stage, I'd actually done all but uh, all but six of the Marilyns. Um, uh, the six being uh, a little place called St Kilda, which has caused no end of problems to us uh, Marilyn baggers. Um, 
Now, the first one is actually quite easy. You've, um, uh, for decades, you've been able to just pay a boat, win a couple hundred quid, uh, go out on a scheduled trip and uh, get to climb Conoco. It doesn't look, it's the least interesting of the, uh, uh, the St Kilda peaks. Um, that was the boat I went out on the MV Kuma. Um, and you get uh, a nice look at the quaint old village. Um, it was abandoned in 1933, I think. Uh, a few Soe sheep there are pretty unique to the place. Um, if the weather's like this, then you get really nice views looking down there on Village Bay and uh, um, island called Dune and other Amara in uh, across the across the water. And uh, you get to the top, and uh, you get a view of this little lot. So much more exciting looking peaks. Um, it was another six years before we managed to uh, make any more progress on this particular project. The reason being that uh, um, the, uh, the place was managed by uh, Scottish Nat Natural Heritage in those days. And uh, basically you weren't allowed to do anything unless you got a valid uh, scientific reason. Um, so uh, oh, I spent years and years trying to liaise with these people and uh, uh, apologise apologies for any uh, English uh, natural heritage, sorry, uh, Scottish SNH people in the audience. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was a bit of a barrier for quite a while. Um, with the, uh, um, the uh, le access legislation changing uh, um, a few years later, uh, we, s we, we managed to set up a trip in 2009 um, with grand ideas of trying to tick off a few of these uh, other uh, other summits. Uh, that's so it was in uh, around a bit Easter time. Not many birds around. Um, trouble is, of course, the weather was terrible. So we sat around on uh, Lewis kind of all week. Eventually, on the Thursday, we uh, uh, we we managed. Uh, we got the AK from the boatman. Boatman. So we headed out and we uh, had to go up for a. Ideally, you land on this side, but the weather was coming in from the west. So uh, um, we. Uh, uh, we went in from the uh, uh, from the east side. Uh, and you see, there's just this huge, great grassy bank. We didn't really know whether there was a way up there, but uh, um, anyway, it turned out there was. So the so you get off your nice, comfy boat into uh, a tiny uh, plastic tender. Uh, Rob, I think we've lost you. Can anybody else hear Rob? Here. Hey, there we go. Yeah, we're back, we're back in business. You can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, yeah, so you get decanted out into this, into this wee, uh, this wee tender, um, and then you hop off. There's, there's obviously no, uh, uh, we missed a, missed one there. Um, uh, not a problem. So anyway, big grassy. So a bit of uh, a bit of scrambling then. There, a huge, great grassy bank really. Um, lots more steep grass. Is that actually grass, or is that just is that just um, on top of rock? Um, that was grass, actually. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, contriving to make it look harder than it was, but it is super steep. Um, it's quite useful to wear something like crampons, actually, because uh, it's really steep. This stuff. Um, uh, we started out just down here to the right, by the way. You can see there's organic colony, and we were just fear of that. So, fortunately, there are no bird issues on this one. Um, so you carry on slogging up this. Uh, uh, best of 3,000 meters of, uh, of steep grass. Eventually, you get up onto this uh, uh, this ridge, so uh, you don't want to look down to the right particularly. Although, if you do, you see this huge great sea stack, uh, 196 meters of it. This is one of the Marilyns that uh, we're not allowed to climb because uh, of reasons that are come to. Um, and uh, you, you wouldn't land on the thing anyway at the moment. Uh, the sea's up, so uh, it's a matter of look, look no touch, not touch and uh, the gannets are getting established. So teetering along this ridge, um, that's the other sea stack, Stackley, that uh, we'll get to a little bit later. And uh, there's a group of, a, um, a group of uh, pretty pleased with themselves uh, Marilyn baggers. So after all these years, we've managed to get to our second uh, St Kilda uh, Marilyn. That's, that's two out of six. Um, and a nice vantage point for the other, the other. So Stackley is is the other kind of inaccessible one. Uh, so a uh, really hard to land on. Conoco is the one we did six years ago. Dune. It turns out uh, a couple of us actually got to a crack at this um, 
uh, the next week because uh, myself and Ian, um, Ian Teasdale here, uh, we were around for a second week. So while the other had to go home, um, I had a word with uh, National Trust uh, for Scotland and uh, asked if it was okay for us to go across the dune. Um, and they said, yeah, okay, just keep away from the, uh, the puffing colony. And by the way, can you take the, uh, uh, the warden across with you? His name was also Ian, as it, uh, as it happened. Um, and there were a couple of spaces on there. One of the boats, um, killed the cruises, were going across. So they said, yeah, if it's okay with the NTS, we'll drop you off there. So, uh, so we headed over in the little tender. Um, and uh, yeah, so lands typical kind of, well, not typical, one of the easier landings. So you land on these, uh, these slabs and uh, you kind of scramble up here, uh, dodging a few formers on the way. And this is the summit up here. And uh, this is the, uh, the view from the summit. Uh, that's actually one of the lower peaks. That's, uh, that's what, what we call a tump. Uh, I think it's some species of rock climb, probably a bit severe. Uh, I started scrambling up it once, but it's certainly above my pay grade. Uh, perhaps go back with a rope sometime. Um, so this is the view from uh, at the top of uh, St Kilda Marilyn number three when we get there. So that's myself and uh, Ian. Uh, with Conica in the back. So yeah, we're pretty pleased with ourselves at that point. Uh, so we've got uh, three out of six. So uh, later that evening, uh, we were reclining in the, uh, at the bar um, at uh, the Harris Hotel um, on the Tarbert uh, with the dram, just reflecting on a uh, pretty good fortnight, really, uh, halfway through the, uh, the Marilyns. And that's still only three out of six. Um, actually, later in that year, we, were, uh, we managed to get another one. Um, um, a guy called Brent uh, arranged a, a trip and uh, uh, we got round kind of the four Marilyns, excluding the two sea stacks again. Uh, but the real crux, in terms of difficulty of landing, the SOA is the one really, because it's pretty well defended on all sides. Um, and uh, this is the kind of full frontal and um, there's a few not very good landing spots along here and we actually landed just here somewhere. Uh, you need it, literally a flat calm and uh, by some miracle uh, the first morning uh, we did have a flat calm in the morning. Uh, just kind of a couple of hours really before the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wind starts to pick up again. So uh, you hop off onto this, you can see it's not the ideal kind of landing spot really. And the other thing about it is um, because of the wave splash, this nice looking rock is actually absolutely murderously slippery. Um, so this is kind of black like him and um, Ian had a really bold lead to get us up this first bit. Um, and then uh, once you're up the up off the scrambling, you've guessed it, it's more super steep grass um, till you get to uh, a nice flat, uh, not very interesting summit. And from the top you get a really good view of uh, um, the, the two that are left. Um, so uh, that's four out of six now and uh, we're now basically at the wall so we've got these two sea stacks uh, the issue is well they're pretty steep and there's a bit of rock climbing and they're pretty hard to land on the actual problem is that they're covered in gannets um, now gannets are really really common birds but um, the problem for us peat baggers is that uh, we in the uk we seem to pretty much corner the market in gannets so um, um, so uh, a, a place like St Kilda, which is a, um, a World Heritage Site, uh, really the gannets take priority. And we're only allowed to go there in the winter, which is kind of a problem because uh, gannets aren't stupid. They're there in the summer and they're out the way when the winter storms arrive. So uh, somehow we've got, to, uh, we've got to land on these things um, outside, the, uh, outside the summer season, which is kind of tricky. I'm pretty sure it hadn't been done before the, um, uh, uh, us lot turned up and uh, it took us, uh, took us a while. Um, so this is Stagan Armin, this is the less steep of the two, although uh, from there it does look uh, kind of challenging. Um, this is a view of it from uh, Bore, where it even looks, looks even more challenging. And you can see again that uh, it's going to be pretty hard to land on, just these slabs. The slabs have got to make it quite difficult for the boatman to get you ashore. Um, if you get a bit closer in, 
uh, you can see it's really just scrambling, but so the crux is actually landing and uh, landing outside the summer season. Now the other one, Stackley, now that really is pretty steep. However you look at it, Stackley is pretty steep. Um, this is the, that's the ascent route actually right there. Um, use a bit of imagination. You've got a, a ledge that goes up here and then you zigzag right. A bit of a climbing pitch here, then you zigzag left again. Um, and then you kind of go around the corner and then it's just a walk uh, up to the top. But that is clearly the, the hardest of the uh, 15, 57 Marilyns. Uh, and as I say, you've got to land, you've got, you've got to uh, find time when you're going to be able to land. Ideally, uh, this, this, is, this is WaveNet data, you can uh, access this online. Uh, it's a couple of boys. This is just west of the Hebrides, so this is a bit closer in. Um, and you can see, oh, just a handful of times, a um, couple of nice uh, kind of opportunities in the summer, but of course the gannets are in uh, full kind of breeding season then, so you can't go near it then. September, um, it's a good time for doing the, uh, the other Marilyns like Soe, but um, still you can't visit the stacks. Uh, late September, still not really, it's still too early. Uh, now, mid-October mid would have been great, but that particular year, uh, a friend of mine was getting married, and uh, unfortunately with me, for, for me, I was the best man, and uh, um, uh, Louise didn't seem to fancy getting married on a sea stack, so we had to knock that on the head. Um, we thought uh, we'd kind of explore this um, November window. Well, it might, might work, it was about a two metre swell, it might work, it might not. Um, well, of course, it didn't work. Uh, we did a lot of standing around, uh, kind of watching the waves, literally washed all the way around the thing. This is Stackley. Um, so uh, we didn't get to climb it, but uh, we, did, uh, uh, we did learn a few lessons, like uh, if it's two metres swell, then just don't even bother going. Uh, the rock gets really slimy in, uh, in winter, and it's probably going to take two or three days to dry out. October really is probably the best chance. You've just got to wait. And, uh, Use your time. Oh, micro spikes are really, really good for landing. Um, seaweedy kind of like any rocks, they're just the best thing. So, uh, back the next year, as it turned out, with our micro spikes. Um, now, that, uh, <coughs> those of you who know anything about birding know that uh, if you're a keen birder, you'll, uh, you'll kind of head to the other end of the country at the drop of a hat. Um, it's kind of the same with uh, St Kilda Sea Stacks, really. You get about a week's notice, um, and unless you can uh, unless you want to fork out two and a half grand uh, to pay the boatman, you've got to get some mates together that are all willing to go, but pretty short notice. So uh, Thursday, Friday, the forecast really looks look great for the start of the next week. Um, so we made our plans. Saturday, well, it didn't look so good. Uh, maybe just the Monday. And we weren't even sure about that. Anyway, we had to kind of leave pretty early Sunday morning, 0500 departure from Peterborough. Picked up my climbing mate, uh, Paul, uh, from Derby. Uh, nine o'clock, we got to Penrith, picked up Michael. At that point, it was a kind of reasonable time to phone up the boatman. Fortunately, he seemed to think that uh, the forecast looked okay. So we carried on that. We got the evening ferry across uh, um, from Skye to Harris, headed down to Leverborough where the boat was based. Another 5 a.m. start. Um, five hours later, we were on the stop of Stack and Armin. Um, and Four and a half hours later, um, half of the party was at the summit of Stack Lee. So uh, one day, two stacks, Marilyn's done. Um, for two of us, that was actually the completion of the Marilyn's. Uh, 11 o'clock back at Lever and somebody noticed there was actually an overnight ferry back to the mainland. Uh, so I was back at my, nest, back at my desk by uh, 2 p.m. the following uh, on the Tuesday. So uh, that was quite a busy weekend, really, but uh, definitely worth it. Uh, now, this is the WaveNet data, uh, just kind of zoomed in a bit for that period. Um, Mid-September, there was a trip, but uh, that was for the more, for Marilyns, and that was actually a two-day trip. They were lucky. Uh, uh, so they got Conacher, they got Dune, they got Bore, they got Soe. Um, and uh, uh, this was our window for the stack. To, it was just a, just a single day, but luckily uh, we, we managed to get two. Um, you can see that was the last, uh, I suppose there was a kind of marginal possibility in November, but uh, we wouldn't have gone for that. And by the middle of, this, of September, the sea was up to 15 metres. That's definitely not the sort of time that you want to be standing on top of a, um, a sea stack, let alone uh, 
trying to climb it. So a uh, couple of summit photos. There's me uh, on top of Stack on Armin, 10 a.m. and 14.40 myself and uh, Pete Ellis on top of Stack Lee. So um, that was me, uh, um, first person to finish the Marilyns. Um, I should mention Pete um, actually um, did all six St Kilda Marilyns within four weeks. That was me taking six years, uh, such an amateur. Uh, um, Pete did. The, Pete, by the way, has also uh, done the, the seven, seven summits, you know, Everest, Denali, all that lot. So uh, um, I'm in quite good company there uh, for uh, finishing that project. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's a route topo. I won't go through the detail, but you land there, a um, bit of a, a kind of scramble up. Then you've got this ledge, and then that, that's actually a proper climbing pitch. It's probably a bit severe maybe 4A um, for the climbers among you. Then you've got a nice, easy, uh, um, uh, wide ledge. Problem is it's, you need the Binguano mostly uh, from the Gannet because uh, in, uh, in the summer it's just full of Gannet. And then you kind of walk up and then this is the, the summit ridge and a little bit of a cairn there. Um, now, uh, uh, here we, uh, th this, this actually comes with a soundtrack, although unfortunately uh, Ollie's the only person that can, uh, that can hear it uh, due to some technical issues. So um, uh, I think he's going to uh, sing to us, I'll do a bit of a voiceover. Uh, so this is Stack and Armin, the first one that we did. Uh, we managed to find a spot to land, um, put a rope up, a safety rope, so uh, um, a nice convenient uh, dike line, so scrambling up that with a safety rope. Um, so all 12 of us got up there, um, see somebody be laying, that's Pete at the top of that first little pitch. And then we've got these slabs, which is just a walk, um, but with the kind of exposed bit around the corner. And then uh, you've got an interesting little scramble across, just, just across here with quite a drop down. That's Pete again. Uh, and then you're on to most the easier ground. Um, again, a few spots where we, we kept the rope in place. Some quite interesting. Uh, that's one of the old uh, uh, bothies. Um, that's Pete at the summit. Uh, Stack Lee behind. Um, and so that's the first summit, uh, first party at the summit. And that's, uh, that's us subsailing back down. Now, we're still pretty early at this point, about uh, 11 a.m., and I figured out that, well, if we got our skates on, we could perhaps uh, go for a there. Uh, so this is the groove. Uh, Your voice is dropping out again, Rob. I don't know if it's dropping out for other people. Yeah, yeah. I think we had a bit of an outage there. Yeah, so that's the landing spot. Um, nice barnacles at this point. So it's quite it's a bit of a scramble there. And we get getting ourselves established uh, um, in this groove. Then uh, then you've got the zig, um, uh, the, zigzag, uh, the zigzag up there. So top of the groove. And then we're going to hang a right. There's quite an exposed little bit coming up. Just here, that's a proper scramble. It's super exposed. You're about 40 meters above the sea at this point. Uh, looking down on the first party that have landed there. Uh, this is the this is the the climbing uh, crux, 11 meter uh, pitch. And then there's this nice, easy but kind of guano deep uh, uh, ledge which we just walk up. Uh, you can see quite a bit of guano there, uh, leftovers from the Oeus Gannet. Uh, the Gannets have uh, pretty much all gone at this point. So there's, there's us finished. And there's Eddie, uh, second person to finish uh, two hours later. And uh, yes, that two hours does matter a lot in this game. Definitely he was the second. <laughs> um, and there's a view from the boat. <laughs> Not that we're competitive or anything. And uh, quite an awkward da abseil down because it's uh, it's a, di a diagonal. Uh, uh, then just heading back down the ledges, and then uh, uh, abseiling down, and then dropping back into the boat. 
and uh, finally we're must away. Be, Rob, it must be quite exciting getting into an inflatable wearing microspikes. Uh, the idea is you take them off so the boatman isn't very happy with them. Actually, he did have that, uh, that kind of um, uh, rubber mat. Uh, yeah, if you've got one of those, you've got a lot more uh, latitude, but it can be an issue. Depends how well you know the boatman and uh, what kind of boat he's got, really. Yeah, so uh, that's so that's the Marilyn's done. Um, now a little bit of a hill running uh, um, interlude here. Um, just want to talk about the uh, uh, the cooling round. So um, this consists of. There's kind of various permutations. Uh, the black cooling, uh, the, the black line here, which is known, uh, very well known, and uh, has been done, of course, uh, by Finley Wild in under three hours now. Um, now, the kind of logical ex um, extension of that is just to go along this line and uh, complete the horseshoe with the other black cooling, so um, Garvin and Clark Glass. Uh, but nicer is to include the uh, uh, the red cooling. Various people, it turns out, have done this over the years. Um, I kind of independently, really. Um, I hit on a slightly different um, permutation, which actually included the additional Black Hill. So Bellig out here, uh, also including Skur Schumann. So it takes in all the Munro tops and uh, finishing with Clack Glass Glaben. Um, and um, having completed that, um, I hit on this, uh, why not do a proper end-to-end -end traverse with all of the red hills? Um, so this is a kind of big zigzag route, which then finishes on the fantastic and the Kylik here above Broadford. Um, to my knowledge, this uh, trans cooling has never been done. I did do the cooling round in 2000. Um, and uh, Yanis Tridimus did it uh, a year later, and it's never been done since. So uh, it'd be kind of really nice if, uh, one of you guys uh, maybe have a serious look at it. Um, this is just a, just a few kind of, uh, a bit of a timeline. So 1911 was the time that the, uh, the Black Cooling main route was first done. Uh, um, it wasn't until uh, 28 years later that Charleston and Ford did the Great Cooling Traverse, including Class, class, class Barven uh, uh, Traverse. Um, then uh, the first Sligacan horseshoe that I know about was Clive Rowland in 1981 who did it in 31 hours, including the three hour bivy. Uh, various people do it more quickly. Um, Mark Shaw is the quickest person I know who's done a basic horseshoe in 16 hours 46. Um, now my somewhat longer um, thing, which I call the cooling round, that also includes Skua Scoom and also Knight's Peak and Berlig and uh, Skua Hain, Skua Street to make a proper kind of circuit. Uh, which I did in, in uh, 23 and a half hours. So that's, in numbers, it's, it doesn't really compare with the likes of the Ramsey. It's a lot shorter, but obviously much more difficult ground. So 33 miles, 23,000 feet, and 59 summits. Um, Janis Tridimus did it a year later, added the peak, and not two hours off my time. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, we were old, old guys. Somebody, somebody quick and really good on rock could really knock a few hours off that time, I bet. Uh, but what would be really good if somebody could uh, crack the trans cooling, uh, which comes out that, uh, yeah, the version I did was a little bit short, a bit took in more peaks than the, uh, uh, than the, the cooling round, um, uh, 64 tops. And I did it in 19 hours, so reasonably quick, but I didn't have time. Uh, actually, the reason why I, uh, uh, I got timed out was the, uh, the weather came in. It was blowing a hoolie for the last few hours. And then the, when the rain came in, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, boulder fields in the dark was obviously not going to work. So, uh, so that uh, remains to be done maybe by somebody. But uh, the cooling round itself is a fantastic round. The, uh, the black cooling uh, is superb. The red, the red hills are really, really brilliant as well. And you've got the black glass. So. Um, Travis, so it, it really is a fantastic round, and uh, um, the details are uh, on the uh, the GoFar site, which some of you will be familiar with. Also, the October um, 2007 uh, Fell Runner magazine has uh, uh, an article by myself on it, so uh, it's worth uh, worth having a read on. Um, anyway, life after the Marilyns. Um,
the next project, which was uh, again, was it was it doable? Was it was it not? Uh, was the Humps? So the Marilyns is 1557. Um, the 100 meter prominent summit, which we fondly know as the Humps, 100 meter prominence, that adds another 1,427 summits and gives you even better coverage. You see, there's even one near my house, kind of. Um, so that was the next project, really. Um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Mark Jackson, who put together the bumper fun book, fun book of humps, he couldn't resist putting that thing on the front, the old man of Hoy, just to suggest that it might be kind of quite a hard thing to do to complete this list. Uh, a little bit similar to Alan Dawson, who uh, um, uh, who compiled the Marilyn's list, and he asked Stackley in his email address. Uh, you know, these uh, these uh, list compilers can't uh, can't resist kind of laying down the gauntlet, and uh, well, us uh, us baggers can't resist kind of uh, rising to the challenge, really. Um, um, and whereas uh, the Marilyn's have two tricky stacks, uh, there's actually five peaks and the humps that uh, require climbing of some kind. Um, this one, uh, you're kind of not supposed to do it really, so uh, it's a low key thing, but it's a, it's a VS4A, so uh, um, I do know somebody who's soloed it, but uh, we, uh, um, I got my climbing mate Paul to, uh, to lead, uh, lead a couple of us up it to super climb. Um, it's in the Peak District, the English Peak District. So that was 2011, um, we did that, that one. Um, it was just kind of a, a midsummer evening after work. Uh, it's not the sort of thing you want to do at the weekend, really. So uh, it was just a fun uh, kind of evening out. So. Uh, the next one, which uh, we knew much less about, um, if the, uh, the Wi-Fi plays ball, uh, was Sheep Rock. That's on Fair Isle, which is halfway between Shetland and uh, Orkney, way up north. Uh, wasn't a lot known about this. Yes, we knew that the uh, locals used to put sheep, put sheep up on the top. Goodness knows why, there's not really much grass up there. Uh, but uh, people were kind of taking photos out of the plain and uh, somebody managed to find uh, a couple of old sepia photos in the St Kilda Museum, the Fair, the, the, uh, sorry, the Fair Isle Museum. And, uh, and somebody got a really good shot of the route and it looked a bit like that really. So uh, I just thought, well, we give it a go. So this is five years later, 2016. Uh, Alan Watley, who is the guy on the ledge here, um, we just kind of went out, took a few goats and a bit of gear and uh, just gave it a go. Um, now, um, the, our boatman is just a tiny boat. Um, this guy um, called Stuart, he was, the, he was the guy that used to actually take, um, lead the kind of sheep placing ex, uh, expeditions. Uh, you can see a tiny kind of uh, um, pole poking up here. That's where they used to place the pulley. Um, and he wouldn't bother with ropes, he'd just kind of hand over hand uh, up a chain that was here. Fortunately for us, the chains were still there. Um, so yeah, so Alan and I managed to get ourselves uh, up uh, Sheep Rock uh, uh, just, before, uh, uh, just before a storm came in, as it happens. Um, and uh, after three days waiting on Shetland for the fog to clear, so a bit of a cliffhanger in more ways than one. Uh, if you're a proper rock, rock climber, then uh, there's always this route, but it's E3 and the rock is terrible. Um, so that's what the thing looks like. It's not quite a, uh, uh, that photo on the right, it's not quite an island, but it's not far off and pretty unstable uh, rock in the, uh, so it's this, this rock on this side is, is the way that the villagers went, is, uh, is definitely the way to go. So that was, that was two. Now the next two um, in the Western Isles uh, off the um, Outer Hebrides, uh, the Mingulay stacks, uh, we knew very little about these two um, it turned out Arnimul, uh turned out to be just a scramble, um, although it was really difficult to land on. Um, there's something about this, this thing that um, uh, whatever the swell forecast it says, you know that the, the actual swell is going to be at least twice, twice the height, um, if this video works. So... Uh, come on video, start up for me. Yeah, okay, that's not going to play ball. Um, anyway, it's pretty bumpy. Um, 
So uh, you, you, can see, you can see from the map in the middle here that Arnhemul and uh, Lianamul are fairly close together. They're basically two um, uh, bits off the side of uh, Mingulay. Now, Lianamul turned out to be a proper, uh, pro uh, a proper rock climb. Uh, there was very little information on it. Uh, again, we just uh, just turned up and uh, gave it a go, really. Uh, again, a bit of um, um, uh, just a bit of footage of um, Dan trying to land. Um, yeah, I don't think the bandwidth is going to allow that, but um, it was a pretty a pretty exciting landing. I was amazed that Dan got ashore. Um, it was the swell was something between two and three two and three meters for that. Uh, but anyway, we got landed, and then we had to find our way up the thing. And it was proper rock climb. Um, come on, next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. Um, no. Um, hopefully, you're now looking at the animal. Um, yeah. So again, the map. Um, so this is the this is the easiest side, and uh, the easiest way we uh, we could find we reckon is about very severe four C. So really quite you know for mere hillbaggers quite a hard route to proper rock climb. Um, supposedly the uh, the islanders used to used to scramble up some route and go up through the roof of the cave, but we couldn't figure it out. So. Anyway, we got up the thing. The, uh, the abseil descent was just across the face of this huge sea cave. That was just fantastic. But, um, uh, 250 meter ropes. Uh, it was just, uh, it's just the most, uh, most exciting thing. So we did kind of cracked it then in that uh, the last one, at least we knew what we were in for. It's a very well known climb, the old man of Hoy. But it's pretty hard. Um, okay, if, you, if you're a if you're a good climber, then E1 is nothing really. But for us, it was really quite a challenge. Had to do a lot of hard work. It's not quite an island. Um, it used to be a sea arch, but it's fallen in. Um, so you you kind of uh, walk down a little bit of a scramble down to get to the uh, to get to the connecting car, and then you've got this fantastic uh, five pitch climb and a couple of views views up. Um, so it's great as E1. 5B, a three-star climb, and uh, looking at, looking up the climb there, um, the summit is just just above there, and uh, our next photo should be me looking uh, really rather pleased with myself, uh, just about to top out on my final hump. So that's uh, hump number two eight eight seven, I think it was. Uh, and uh, a great place to finish. Um, by the way, we did this just at the end of the heat wave and uh, just before yet yeah, another storm. Um, the storm came in at four o'clock and we were down about an hour and a half before that. Uh, so there's, uh, there's us on the top of the old man of Hoy. Um, it's just a really uh, brilliant uh, place to finish the, uh, the hump. So uh, again, uh, a list that we go on there, no idea whether it was doable or not, uh, but it turned out to be with, uh, um, a bit of hard work and a little bit of luck. Um, so it turns out though that there are peaks overseas as well. Um, and uh, just kind of canter through these a little bit. Uh, but uh, there is a kind of a uh, heat map of the, uh, uh, the most prominent peaks of the world. Um, those resolve themselves into the 50 most prominent peaks um, in the world. The next slide, if you can see it. Um, so this is what we call the, the world's 50 finest peaks. Um, so the coloured peaks are ones that I've done. I'm actually exactly halfway through as it, uh, as it, uh, as it happens. Um, mostly I'll concentrate on the, the ones that I haven't done, the white ones. So the Alaska, um, they're just kind of too cold and too hard really, uh, too expensive for the likes of me. Um, there's a couple of really tricky ones. Uh, Cristobal Colon, that's in Colombia, and there are problems there with the uh, the native tribes just don't want uh, their way of life compromised by allowing visitors in, which is fair enough. Pico Bolivar is interesting. That used to be straightforward, but it's in Venezuela, and with the political situation, uh, 
it's just not doable enough, sadly, uh, at the moment. San Valentin, um, well, the weather's terrible, and uh, you've got to be quite good at skiing for that one. Um, Africa, I've actually done the full set of the African uh, uh, peaks. Uh, we'll look at a couple of them uh, in a bit. Um, Elbrus, I was due to do this summer, but I guess with coronavirus, that's not going to happen uh, this year now, sadly. Um, I missed out on Greenland here. That again, it's pretty expensive to get to, and you really want to be a skier for that, so I probably won't do that. There's a whole bunch of peaks uh, in and around the Himalayas, including the likes of Everest, Kanchenjunga, K2, and the lower peaks are really no easier. So I'm not going to do any of those. Um, Khrushchevskaya uh, um, is a, a very interesting uh, peak. It's a very active volcano. Nobody really knows where the summit is. It's probably somewhere different every time you go up. And if you're really unlucky, um, uh, you'll find that the central cone is, uh, is actually the high point that year. And you're definitely not going to get to that one. Anyway, hopefully we're going we're gonna to go there next year um, all being well. And uh, we might get up it. And uh, with a bit of luck, we'll get to the high point. Punjak Dyer, that's one of the seven summits, the seven continental summits. And that one's doable. Um, it's pretty expensive, but I'm kind of tempted to do that one sometime. Um, Australia doesn't get a look in. Um, Mount Cook in New Zealand, that is, that is one of the set. Again, that's a very difficult peak. Just there was a, there was a very big rock fall. Um, so anyway, that's the World 50 Finest, a really, really big challenge. It'd be interesting to see whether anybody ever completes that list. Uh, you've got to be a professional mountaineer that can be bothered to do easy stuff as well. So uh, a kind of... Um, so just kind of whipping through some of the uh, some of the peaks, uh, just picking out some of the issues really. Uh, so there's one peak without a completion date by me. Uh, it's just kind of well, a long list of excuses really. Loads of red tape, really really crowded, very expensive. Takes three months. It's pretty dangerous. Um, extreme altitude. I can't see me ever bothering to do that somehow. Um, I've just got to put up with people asking me whether I've done it for the rest of my life, but well, I can cope with that. Um, so looking at ones that I have done, Mont Blanc, that's one of the, uh, the world's 50 uh, most prominent peaks. Uh, it tends to be pretty crowded, although if you go in June, actually you get it to yourself, there are just a few paragliders, so that was really, really nice. We were quite lucky there. Um, Ararat in Turkey, that's a super peak. Um, effect that you get with uh, some of these really high peaks. The peak's own shadow is cast uh, kind of on the, uh, the, the atmospheric dust um, at dawn. Uh, sometimes the peak's closed. It's not the easiest peak to, to get to always. Uh, yeah, the next in Iran. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, hope, hope, hopefully we're here again. Uh, next yeah, week, yeah. Uh, Dam, uh, Damavan in Iran um, speaks for itself, political issues there, but uh, if you can get there, the, uh, the people are really friendly and it's, it's a nice peak, nice straightforward climb. Uh, we climbed that in 2009. I was with a bunch of Americans and I reckon if anybody's going to get uh, kidnapped, it's probably going to be them. Um, Kilimanjaro, loads of people climb that. Again, crowds, red tape. It's pretty expensive, but it's a great peak. Um, just over the border is Mount Kenya. Uh, now that does have a trekking peak, but the actual high point, uh, it's, it's a quite serious rock climb, 19 pitches, um, a load of abseiling, a 400 meter rock climb, and you've got a little bit of technical kind of ice and snow at the top. So you, you're doing quite hard climbing at 5,000 meters with your overnight gear on your back, which uh, it's a super peak, but it's really quite hard. I got a whole bunch of uh, volcanoes on the list. Um, I've picked out uh, Sumeru, which is the highest point of, uh, of Java. Um, it erupts every 40 minutes, regular as clockwork. Uh, fortunately, the high point is about a kilometre away from the active uh, crater, so you just get really spectacular views. Quite a number of volcanoes I've climbed that subsequently uh, erupted and have been uh, um, inaccessible, uh, sometimes sadly with fatal consequences. Um, Quite a few of these peaks have quite unfriendly vegetation. Uh, certainly, that uh, some of the Mexico peaks, Volcán de, de, de las Tres Virgenes. Um, uh, you, do, you don't want to use some of those uh, plants as handholds for sure. 
but they look just gorgeous. It's a really lovely landscape. I do like uh, desert peaks. Um, moving into the northern uh, northern US, just south of the Canadian border, actually, Mount Cleveland. Uh, red tape issues with this. We had a horrendous route because we couldn't get, couldn't get the permit for the route we wanted. Really bad bushwhack in the 28 hour day, as I recall. But uh, it's one of my top 10 peaks. I mean, the, the scenery there is just, just unbelievable. Those northern Rockies uh, extend through into uh, Canada. And our next peak is actually in the Canadian Rockies, Mount Odin. Actually, technically, it's not the Rockies, it's one of the other uh, ranges. Uh, I put this down to Richard about this. It's a kind of a five day peak. Um, I decided I was going to do it in uh, a long day and two half days. And it was a super long day, actually. Uh, uh, I went two hours past my turnaround time. I was on my own. Um, and I finished in the dark. And uh, I was a little bit lucky not to get benighted. But uh, if you don't take these risks too often, then you kind of get away with it. But uh, it's a fantastic peak. But, uh, you know, you have to uh, uh, make some judgment sometimes. And sometimes you make the judgment to turn around, which is what we did. This is another British Columbia peak, Mount Farnham. Didn't do that one, still haven't done it. Um, Greg uh, sketched out our route on this photo. Uh, so we kind of forced, slugged away at the, uh, um, uh, we found we, this was a kind of ice climb. We didn't have the, the right gear. We couldn't find a way up. Uh, we got to our turnaround time and we turned around and thankfully we found our way down. But it was a very, very scary day out that was. Uh, this is much more straightforward, but pretty fickle weather in New Zealand. This is Taranaki. Um, and uh, that's what it looked like in the evening, but to the right is what it looked like when we were on it. We're in the middle of a cloud, it was rainy. And you quite often get that. Uh, as funny enough, you do in Scotland, you know all about that. Uh, um, and just, um, yeah, kind of unexpected issues, really. I, um, I was just in Indonesia a month ago, just as the, uh, um, just as the pandemic was uh, uh, starting to look very serious. Uh, we were supposed to go to Malaysia. Fortunately, we didn't go to Malaysia because uh, the place was in lockdown by the time we'd have gone there. Uh, I managed to get six peaks uh, on Java in the end. Um, uh, this is us practicing uh, social distancing on uh, Sikaray. Uh, um, a bit worried about the Indonesians. Although actually I did check um, uh, just, uh, just this evening and uh, I think the deaths are just over 200 now and they're still not in lockdown. It's quite remarkable that uh, I think things are going to get very, very bad there. But anyway, as I say, I managed to get six peaks and I managed to get home uh, one way or another. And you just don't know what you're going to uh, uh, come across with uh, some of these uh, some of these peaks. And just just kind of the people aspect, just to finish. Um, uh, you're looking here, um, not the guy on the left. I think he's just done the one. but. Uh, uh, the, you've, um, here we've got the four uh, um, top kind of ultra baggers in the world. Um, Denise and Richard here, myself, I'm in second place. And in, in, inevitably the Norwegian here is, uh, is in first place. Um, and there's a kind of interesting situation that we collaborate a lot, but we're all so long rivals and we're really competitive. But uh, because of the nature of peaks, you kind of have to share information and uh, we can't often do trips together. It's just a kind of fun uh, setup, really. Uh, this is the front runners list, so you can see Petter there, uh, uh, way out in front. I'm 19 behind. I was just one behind at one point, but uh, I can't catch the guy up. Um, my only hope is that I'm nine years younger than him, and uh, he's got to slow down eventually. Although there's no sign of it at the minute. Uh, you can see that the Brits here have got very much got the team prize. We've got two, three, and four, and then the next eight are American uh, from the US. Um, yeah, so on that note, really, uh, we're kind of uh, uh, a bunch of peak baggers uh, all kind of competing, but also collaborating and uh, just itching to get back, back on the, the hills again, as of course are we all. So thanks for listening, and sorry it took a little while. Rob, Rob that, was, that was amazing. Um, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, does, uh, does, does anybody have any questions? I, I don't quite know how the questions are going to work. Um, you can either try unmuting or sticking something in the chat window. Rob, it's uh, Mark Hartree. Can you hear me? 
Yes, Mark. Yeah, I just wondered, is there any, uh, when you're going through your prominent sort of intro, are any hills have a greater prominence than their height? I'm thinking, is there places that, are, you know, if you yeah, go no, from sea no, level to the top, but could you go from somewhere that's below sea level to the top? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, you might see, uh, in terms of climbing, you could, um, well, telescope peak com comes to mind where you're actually starting significantly below sea level, but uh, its prominence is based on uh, the lowest car between it and its uh, its neighbour, its, uh, its kind of parent peak. So no, the, uh, the most you can have is a peak's prominence being equal to its height. Uh, oh. which you get in the case of an island high point like Everest or like St Kilda Sea Stacks. So yeah, mathematically that's not possible. Um, Rob, it's, uh, it's, it's Ollie here. A question for you going back to St Kilda. When you were doing Stack and Armin and Stack and Lee, or Stack Lee, what uh, evidence of human, what human evidence did you see on those islands? Um, right, uh, yeah, they, they have been climbed a lot in the past. Uh, when St Kilda was, um, uh, was inhabited, um, they, they climbed them both um, and uh, connect gannets eggs and also the young gannets. Um, so in um, Stack Lee, partway at the kind of top of that big wide ledge, there is actually uh, um, a bossy, they call it. I mean, it's, uh, you can just about kind of squeeze a couple of people into it. And there were those two structures that you could see in one of the photos on uh, Stack and Armin. Uh, actually, famously, a couple of St Kildans actually got marooned on, I think it was Stack and Armin, uh, all winter. Um, uh, they just couldn't get off and they had to just survive. Uh, actually, I don't know how, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's certainly uh, evidence of uh, um, uh, folks having been there. Um, do you think they would have ascended the same routes that you climbed with ropes? Um, well, they wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't have used ropes on, I think, either of those two. Although they, um, they did. Uh, what they tended to do was go down the go down the cliffs uh, to collect eggs and, and birds. So they would just go down like with a hemp rope, really. You know, not our kind of proper climbing rope. Uh, so they did use ropes, but uh, the sort of stuff that we were doing, they would just scramble that, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, in, 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 impressive stuff. I mean, they were professional climbers, let's face it. <laughs> That's good. It, 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 any, any questions from anybody else? No? Okay. Well, I just want to say a, a, a really big thanks, Rob. It's um, <clears throat> been well worth the wait. Really pleased that you've uh, uh, finally managed to, uh, to, to do your Kenethi Winter Talk. Um, this will be um, posted online as a video. And um, next week, we have the amazing uh, Spike, uh, Stephen Pike, who completed all the Munros in under 40 days. So same arrangement, tune in at the same time and um, looking forward to uh, 